Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the end of the semester. Happy holidays, feeling festival and generous. My assistant and I thank you for staying with us. You're welcome for this whole semester. Okay, assistant, appreciate it. She's gotten much bigger during the semester. She was now seven months old. Okay, you can go down now. Thank you, Juniper. Um, but no, it's if doing everything we can. Again, most of you are doing okay. You stayed with, uh, with it and I, I give you all a lot of credit. Now, I haven't obviously graded everything yet because people are still handing in some late things and that's okay. You know, depending on your circumstances, because I know everybody's got some pretty interesting circumstances, we'll consider, you know, the points and the lateness, and I will do everything I can. That having said, and that's why I'm feeling generous, ho ho. Uh, having said that, the other side of it is we have given you a lot of chances and not. Every, you know, everybody with an 87 wants an A, you know? And, you know, we've already curved up some grades. We, you know, so I'll give people who have done everything and have obviously made some effort the benefit of the doubt. So, you know, happy holidays, we appreciate it, but I can't make every 87 into an A. Um, for, uh, we do have the one last, little quizlet, which will be from today's presentation, due tomorrow at midnight. Another five points most of you will get. Uh, <coughs> and so that, that will be that. And I will be taking, and there was no final exam. You know, I, I bagged all of that because, you know, that's just more stress and none of us need any of that. So we're basically done as of tomorrow with everything. I will be reviewing again and again over the next two weeks, every assignment, every test, making sure that we've covered everything for you. So that's what we do. And the last thing we do is the history of the internet, the modern thing. Um, Are you recording? I, I think I should be. Oh man. Uh, two, two, two. Yeah, he's recording. Okay. okay. Normally, I have to hit a button, and I didn't. But okay. No. okay. I thought it did. Yeah, same here. Uh, yeah, it says it's it is it says it's recording. It's got the little. It's got the little light on, but no, always good to ask because we all know glitches happen and they will continue next spring. I would think next spring, we're gonna go through the same stuff. Next fall looks better. Anyway, um, we will do history of the internet. We know internet and society uh, keeps us all connected. Anybody. Though one of the things they say is the world is flat. What does that mean? Anybody for the internet? It means when I call the, the helpline, and true story, I don't get somebody in Chattanooga. I get Sanjay in Bangalore, India, you know, and who's a very hard working person who is looking for a lot of the same jobs you all are. And, but yeah, right on the other side of the world. So we're all connected. As a matter of fact, I have, uh, I, I got a very nice note from Vitali Ziblik of uh, Belarus, um, formerly Soviet Union the other day. And he's a radio broadcaster uh, in the front lines in the last communist country in Europe. So yes, but that's where my family's from. And they found me through the internet. 
anyway, disruptive to other media. It's all, everything's online. As we see today, unreliable, unreliable information, nobody checks. So we're getting all sorts of crazy stuff, as you know. Symbiosis with other media. We're getting our movies, we're getting our radio, we're getting our TV, and it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And we're always plugged in these days. Okay, quick history. Oh no. Quick history. And I just checked this. I hate when that happens. Welcome to copyright. Convention, here it is. Yep, same one. The internet is the defining technology of our time, an historic revolution in communications for the human race that is changing the world. Well, the internet is the next big thing. It is on a par with the wheel and fire and language and the printing press. The internet enables millions of people with personal computers to communicate. And we already know this, but I want to show you the background. <laughs> This is the age we know. And this is 10 years old, but it's good to show the background. Oh, here's something that came from to manage material and manpower, as GPS the UN coalition did in the war against me. Saddam Hussein. Because it's all plugged in. Okay. Let's get our back. Okay, here's the background. And more useful in the sharing of information among people. Computer communication was a flight of imagination far beyond anything at the movies. Computers were portrayed as sci-fi props like electronic brains alongside robots, ray guns, and flying saucers. In fact, the idea of a worldwide communications network of computers was far more imaginative than anything Hollywood came up with. After all, the first computers were monstrously large and expensive devices that were never in. And all of that now fits in your pocket. Tended to communicate. All the computers were as big as a room. You were lucky to have one in a city or maybe one on a campus or if you were lucky, one in a room. They could have remained standalone computing machines for a long time. But a frightening display of Soviet scientific superiority during the Cold War spurred them into teamwork. In October 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. To catch up and hopefully surpass the Soviets in space technology, President Eisenhower created a bureau at the Defense Department called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was in charge of the space program, which then included computer science. But when the space program got its own agency, NASA, computer research fell into relative obscurity. Bottom line when the russians during the cold war the russians got the nuclear devices they got missiles in cuba we got scared so the u.s government got into the computer business the idea being that if the russians took out washington or chicago or new york you would have a network that could still communicate with each other the big difference hint 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 between the internet and other media is it came from the US government. It wasn't made to make profit like the telegraph or the, or the camera or broadcasting. It was made to be nonprofit. And this is one of the problems we still have is because it's free and open, it's hard to make money. It's hard to be a business. Is it a utility like the phone company? <coughs> or is it a private thing like, um, like a broadcast outlet? The answer is we don't know. So the answer to the test, extra credit, 
is it comes from the government. This is why it's different from everything else. It is a nonprofit organization. America turned its attention to conquering the stars and beating the Russians in space. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Okay, well, yeah, the space race. Meanwhile, hang around a while and leave. Like letters going through post offices, Kleinrock showed how packages of data would queue or line up at the nodes of a. So they're figuring out how to make computers talk to each other. An Achilles heel, and still does. If the connection path between telephones is broken, the call is lost. That weakness became a matter of national security to the military in the early 60s, when they feared a Soviet nuclear attack. Right. Besides leveling American cities, the telephone system would be so damaged that the military would be unable to launch a counterattack. To assure retaliation, America needed an indestructible communications network. Paul Baran was hired to see if one could be built. We started off by uh, playing with uh, fishnet type networks so that if you chop it up, there's still a path through the network. So that's problem. the whole idea that it was not a straight line in case we get attacked. Okay. For stopping the Vietnam War. For others, it was landing on the moon. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Listen, all this cool stuff is happening. But in the world of computers, the new big idea was something called time sharing. The old computers had been big machines that you punched cards and you submitted the cards in decks, and the next day you got the answers. But in 69, time sharing was happening where you would actually sit at a terminal and you would. Yep. So you're starting to build these networks. And again, I won't get into the, the nuts and bolts and the details. And so I had built the, the. Okay. So they're building networks. Okay. We get to more of that. All these scientists. And no one had done that before. BBN won the contract and went to work building the EMPs for the ARPANET on January 1st, 1969. The first was due at UCLA in nine months. Hart's team faced a crush of... So they're building these networks at universities. The government is paying for it. Nobody's making any money. Not like broadcasting. Computer to it. The thrill was connecting things together. You know, there's action at a distance. How, th you know, you can wiggle something. All right. So they're connecting universities all over the country. Aha. This is a funny story. Killer application that would bring in the masses and take the usefulness of. Again, just like the telegraph. The big thing is not so much the network, but what you put on it. And look at the first thing they put on it. Computer networking to a new level. That killer app was email. I was actually working on a mail program, but it was programmed for a single computer so that you could send messages from yourself to another user on the same time sharing computer. And uh, I had written a couple of programs to transfer files. And it occurred to me that since the mailbox that I was sending these messages to was nothing more than a file, I could send that file across the network instead of keeping it within the same machine. And so I put two programs together, modified the code a little bit, and the first email program was, was created. Tomlinson did more than just write the code for email. In a keystroke, he gave the world a new icon for the information age, the at sign. The at sign was the most obvious choice because we're talking about a user who was at some computer. He invented email and the at sign. Scientists out there in California, and this wasn't part of his regular job, unintended consequences. He was just messing around and he invented sense. email. So the, all of these things are happening and no one's making any money on it. 
what was his name? His name was, and he just died this year. Computer networking to a new level. That killer app was email. I was actually working on a mail program, but it was programmed for a single computer so that you could send. Ray Tomlinson. We were very conscious that we were opening up new territory and that rather than pick very limited uh, applications, that we ought to lay a foundation that was as broad and open-ended as possible. Inclusion guided the network's development. Anyone could contribute ideas about its use and how to improve it. Totally different than all the other things. They're not competing, they're all working together. A tradition together. of sharing of knowledge and people will add to it they will find mistakes and bugs and they'll fix them they'll tell you about them and everybody Scott else the rate of Dr. evolution Vincent, sir, the rate at which the, the new functionality can be added is, is very http so you're they're all adding little bits to it lifestyle and their technology that this packet switching was just too unreliable and they didn't have to worry about it and the fact that they were immune so they're all okay and grant money Soon, other networks emerged. There were LANs, or local area networks, to link computers throughout offices. And WANs, or wide area networks, to link computers across buildings or campuses. But each new network was like a foreign country speaking its own language. Could disparate networks be interconnected to make grant money? Soon, other networks... Okay, sorry about that. ...the TCP IP protocol that if followed by different computer networks would allow that yep, HTTPS, that's what he, he, this guy invented. Mm. So you have all these pieces it's coming much together. Harder. Uh, so in fact, the reason that the network works at all is that we have worked very hard to create all this common. And it, the idea was it was supposed to be open for everybody, unlike NBC and CBS. And Disney this is and the computer mouse are as significant in shaping the use of the internet as the first M. However, one of the internet's major milestones was achieved not by technology, yes, but by an act of Congress. On June 9, 1992, Congress passed a bill taking the internet out of the exclusive hands of government and into the public. The following November, President Bush signed it into law. The internet had crossed the Rubicon. There you go. It was all private and run by the government. The Cold War ended, ended, the Berlin Wall fell down, and the Soviet Union collapsed. We didn't need that security anymore. So the government opened up the internet for everybody. So it's like air and water. And you see all of these scientists who think, oh, we're going to share the knowledge of the world. Did they think that people would be sharing conspiracy theories and cat videos? No. They really thought it was going to be a beautiful thing. The government, in particular, National Science Foundation, which had been investing in research in the ARPANET and then the internet, began. So that's what happened. Storing information in trees, uh, in matrices, they'd been programmed to work like that. They hadn't really been programmed to store information in random, as random associations. So that when you smell a particular type of coffee and it takes you back to the coffee house where you first smelt it. And this that is guy sort of connected all the networks and made the web page. The World Wide Web. The next thing you know, it started growing on itself. It went from just Tim in his little computer in Switzerland. Yeah, Swiss guy invented the web browser. The last browser, but it was a breakthrough application. In this case, a short video. Like the killer app that brought the fire Again, of the internet, the internet and web to humankind. In 1993, after Andreessen's browser hit, the web grew by 341,000%. By the late 90s, the internet had grown in simplicity of use, complexity of performance, and... So that's the basic background. That again, it came from the government, they turned it loose, boom. Anyway, 
and no one knew what to do. It was totally deregulated and decentralized. Came from, again, after the Cold War, we wanted a decentralized network in case the Russians attacked. Uh, based on universities and it, they all played around. First email, 1971. Hundreds of universities got on the net by the 1970s. TCP IP, which is that HTTP, we saw the guy, 1982. Here's something not on the video. That's the internet. But then we had Steve Jobs make the computer to put the, the Apple computer to put on the internet. And IBM came out with the PC in 1984, decentralizing the computing from the mainframes. You didn't have those big computers, you could put it on your desk. Originally, the computers were meant to, you know, just be word processors or spreadsheets. Microsoft came in and put, gave you the operating system, OS, to put on the computers to make sure all the computers work, work together. At this time, you have, like they showed in the video, closed networks. You had dial-up. You had to make a um, call to call other computers. It wasn't free and open. That's where America Online and GeoCity started though. It was the idea of having a bigger network. It exploded in the 90s. HTML came in 1992. US deregulates and opens it all up. Boom. Everybody starts using it. Amazon started in 1996 and did not make profit for the first 10 years. First laptops started in 1996 as well. Internet Act of 1996 government tried to keep the porn off. The conservative Republican Supreme Court said no. Why? Because unlike, and I would ask this on a test, but we're not having a test. Unlike um, the broadcast network, the broadcast network, not everybody could be channel 12 or channel nine. You have to have a license to use it. You don't need a license to set up a web page, anybody could do it. So the Supreme Court said, well, if you can do it, put all the porn you want on it now, or cyberbullying. They're not gonna get into what's pornographic and what's not and what's free speech and what's bullying and what isn't. So good or bad, because the network is free and open. And that's the big lesson here that we're not gonna regulate it. This is the ultimate, the internet is the ultimate market. Uh, and it's totally deregulated. Um, internet bust 1998, because it is free and open, nobody knew how to make money off of it. They just put up a web page and get investors to invest in all of these internet startups. Nobody made any money. What started to work advertising and retail. The old economy is the thing that makes the new internet work. Okay, Google started in 2002, search engines, and we all know about search engines, they don't really give you, they give you the information based on the popularity rather than accuracy. Earliest, uh, you know, wireless early 2000s, laptops, the iPhone and the iPad. Did anyone know they needed an iPhone before 2006? No. So, um, and then 2017, we, we further deregulated and said, no, then abandoned net neutrality. Net neutrality is the idea that the government would ensure equal access to the internet for everybody. So your web page is as easy, has the equal rights as Disney. The FCC said, no, if you have the money, we're not gonna deny your free speech just based on the fact that you have money. 
So there is, again, we're seeing more Disney and more Sony and more PBS and CBS, not PBS, NBC and CBS on the internet now. Again, they can. Issues in the modern internet, ownership, who owns, nobody owns the network, but everybody's scrambling for who owns the content. Even here, even, even on a school setting, some content is owned by the school, some is owned by the teachers, some is owned by the public. It's a mess. Reliability, Lord knows, because it's free and open, nobody, this is the biggest expansion of free speech. There is no censorship or very little. They can get in trouble after the fact, you know, basic um, prior restraint. There is no prior restraint. So anybody could say anything. There is no control over what's true and what's not true. Net neutrality, bigger corporations could put on stuff. Regulation is difficult because everybody's on it and there's all sorts of free speech. Plus a lot of stuff, a lot of our political speech comes from Russia and China. So does a lot of porn. Copyright issues, the Chinese just take all our content, repackage it and sell it back. Digital divide, we are seeing now. Some of you have access to big old computers. I have one that I'm using on my desktop right here that has a lot of memory. A lot of you are trying to try to work on your phones at home. Not everybody has the access and people with more money have better access, better technology, and they get more stuff and more on the internet. Interconnectedness, we're all interconnected. The economic model right now, so much is, for, why pay, and this is a problem I have, I'll, I'll admit it, why pay for good professional media when you can get crap for free? Real reporters, real entertainers, need to feed their families. So they had advertising and paywalls. You can get all the crap you want for free. This is the problem. There is no economic incentive to support professional journalism or other forms of media. Decoupling of advertising is part of it. Even if you work with advertising, you know, like commercials or ads in print, the advertiser doesn't need the media anymore. The advertiser could send you emails. Lord knows I get them all the time. Direct mail, to get, you don't need the media. So the traditional media model doesn't work anymore. What do we do about it? We haven't figured it out. So it is the Wild West still, and we are seeing the um, downside. And, you know, it's sad seeing that, that the little history video and you have these scientists in the 60s and 70s saying, we're going to connect the knowledge of the world and set it free for all of humankind. And then, and, and they never saw cyberbullying or porn or crazy stuff coming. So be careful out there because it is up to you to figure out what's real and what's not. The government isn't gonna do it and there's no economic incentive for you to support good media. Huh. So that's the world in a semester. Anyway, I have the one credit, the one, the, the one five point question, and I already told you the answer. It's in the recording, so anybody could do it. Anyway, 
Any other questions on any of this stuff? Um, I know you told us the answer for the extra crack quiz, but could you repeat nope. that? Uh, nope, nope, sorry. You have to listen. You can play back the video and I, and I can tell you, it'll be on there in an hour. Okay. All right, so there is that. So, yep, yep, yep. Sorry. See, that's the whole point of these things, to make you, uh, the whole point is to like make you listen. And so, so that way you learn stuff by accident. So, <laughs> but anyway, but I'll be around for the next couple of weeks if you need anything. Uh, and this will be up in probably in an hour. And you can just take a look. It's in the first 15 minutes or so. <laughs> All right. And it's right there. Any other stuff? Well, I appreciate it. And Juniper appreciate it. I wish I could say it's been fun. But it's been OK. I got to know several of you. And that's the important thing. So guys, anything I could do, let me know. Ain't going anywhere for a while. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. Appreciate Thank you. it. Have a good rest of your year.